It's been a great day. Um, and uh, we're coming to the end of another uh, API Days Australia. And I can't believe we're going to then go, go away for a year until the next one. But in the meantime, I mean, as we shared this morning, there's a lot of other activities around API Days, like the API scene um, and uh, other overseas API Days um, conferences, uh, as well as the Women in APIs and the uh, uh, um, a Sustainable API Initiative. So uh, things for you all to check out in the, in the gaps. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce you now. Very excited to introduce our uh, Locknote speaker, um, Dr. Dennis Bauer is uh, the head of cloud computing, uh, sorry, cloud computing bioinformatics at our venerable CSIRO. Um, Dennis is an internationally recognized expert in artificial intelligence, and she's passionate about, uh, about improving health and understanding of the secrets of our genome using cloud computing. Uh, Dennis is an AWS data hero, um, and she's determined to bridge the gap between academic, academia and industry. And as a previous academic, I'm uh, all for that uh, bridging of that gap. Um, so uh, please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage, Dr. Dennis Bauer. Fantastic to be here with you today at API Days Live Australia. Okay, thank you. All right, so with that, Let's jump straight into it. Um, so as I was saying, my name is Dr. Dennis Bauer. I'm a government research scientist, professor at an Australian university and an AWS hero. And today I want to talk to you about cloud-based bioinformatics or how APIs enable global collaborations and really accelerate health and medical research. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I will have convinced you that APIs are absolutely crucial in order to really find this collaboration between academia and industry and bring the, um, bring the genomic research or the medical research at large forward. But before we go there, allow me to introduce the research organization that I'm part of, which is Australia's government research agency, CSRO. So at CSR are really passionate about translating research into products that people can use in their everyday lives. The most famous product is, of course, Wi-Fi. But in the medical space, um, our most famous product is the Onto server, which is the first um, terminology server that underpins Australia's digital health system and UK's digital health system. In the mobile app space, the CardiHub app was the first clinically validated used app uh, in heart, rehabil re heart rehabilitation. And on a lighter note, we developed the Total Wellbeing Diet, which recipes are now on the book bestseller list alongside Harry Potter and the Da Vinci Code. From that perspective, we do have a nice balance between products that people need and products that people enjoy. Now, I'm part of the eHealth Research Center, which is quite unique in spanning this full value chain from basic science all the way up to bringing health technologies and services to the clinical practice. So with that experience, let me tell you three stories. The first one is around understanding the genome. And each one of those, um, each one of those stories have their own API element to it. So in the understanding part of the genome, it's around how we use the data. The second story is around how we can manipulate the genome. So taking it from understanding to actually doing something that has actionable insights from the healthcare system and therefore powering new therapeutics applications. And the last one is around how we need to modernize the way we work together and how APIs specifically help in building things that are larger than the sum of their parts. So let me start by saying everyone has mutations in their genome that should inform clinical care. Now, the genome is basically the blueprint that defines how our body is shaped and uh, what kind of future disease risks we have. And therefore, 
it also encodes in there how we react to certain drugs. Therefore, there shouldn't be any adverse drug reactions um, that we have to experience ourselves. Reading the genome and interpreting it the right way should guide us to what kind of drugs we should be using. Similarly, with cancer therapy, the way that our cancer has evolved and what it is susceptible to should be or is encoded in the genome. So with this wealth of information, it's not surprising that it's used more and more in the clinical practice, creating so-called mega biobanks, where the genome of multiple individuals are packed together uh, into one massive data resource. And now with 3 billion letters in each of our genome, this resource is absolutely astounding. It's sort of an unprecedented resource. And therefore, the data has become too large to be moved around. Um, and therefore, the analytics needs to go to the data. Now, this is a completely new concept. And I would argue is absolutely underpinned or powered by the use, the clever use of APIs. In this particular case is that we have this massive data that can't move and the analysis between them, the analytics accessing it needs to be brokered by APIs. Now these APIs not only broker the actual raw data access to it, but they can have <clears throat> clever use on top of that around access privileges, for example, or petitioning the data to serve out in smaller parts so that these massive chunks of data can be analyzed with, um, with analytics on the fly. So for that, we have developed VariantSpark, which is a machine learning library in order to analyze the human genome. Particularly in there, um, we're using an elastic MapReduce cluster, which is an, um, on an AWS infrastructure. That is basically the core but it is interacting with the data, which is located on an S3 bucket through some sort of API. And in there, it's doing exactly that. It's serving out small chunks of the, of the genome that the machine learning method needs to read in, particularly at that time that it actually needs it, rather than having to hold this whole information in memory. Now, this whole architecture is then powered by Jupyter Notebooks, so that researchers can go in there and do visual analytics <clears throat> and more data-driven approaches. Now, the reason that we're using an elastic MapReduce cluster, which is a Spark cluster, is because the traditional systems of high-performance compute can't handle these massive amount of data. Now, the way I think about it, is that traditional systems were compute intensive tasks. So this will be like the Bureau of Meteorology doing weather forecast, where you can break down each of those weather cells into their own little buckets, and there can be computed on these traditional high performance compute clusters. No information need to go between nodes. Whereas in the genomic space, where the data is so massive and every location in the genome is actually important to bring together to make those risk um, gene predict predictions. It is important that the data can free freely flow between nodes, basically dissolving the boundary between nodes and using all the CPUs that are on one, that are available in this particular cluster. And this is exactly where Spark comes in with a distributed computing paradigm. Um, and therefore this is a data-driven approach rather than a com computer intensive task. So with this, we developed, as I said, VariantSpark to use exactly this notion of distributed computing. With that, it was able to process today's data, today's genomic data, 3.6 times faster than typical um, solutions in that space, for example, the ones developed by Google. But we also show that it can scale to tomorrow's data, which could be 1 trillion genomic data points. And it can do that in 15 hours rather than using 100,000 years what other tools would use. So bringing this awesome compute power to the biological space, we looked at cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer in Australia and all around the world. 
So here we looked at case control studies. So people that do not have cardiovascular disease and the ones that are suffering from it. And the question was, can we find something that is specific to the genome of the people that suffer from it um, that we can then pinpoint and use in biomarkers future risk predictions? So here we have a 50,000 case control cohort we're using variant spark in order to identify the individual disease risks. Now with, uh, with this approach, we already know that there is a genomic component to cardiovascular disease. But the surprising thing here was that how these um, genome parts of you know, the whole genome are interacting with each other. So for example, there are elements in there that modulate the risk to make it personal so that um, someone with a specific misspelling in the genome or a specific mutation in the genome, their normal, you know, otherwise not considered normal cholesterol levels are already on the dangerous side and need to be monitored. And with this kind of personalized risk prediction, I think going forward, the clinical care that we can give to individuals are much better. And all of this is powered by really understanding the genome reading it and building these complex machine learning models. But we're also applying it outside of the human genomic space, particularly in the infectious disease COVID space, because here again, the virus is mutating, it's changing um, its blueprint. And it's particularly doing that once it changed to a different host. So we know that it has originated in bat, there was some intermediary, and then it jumped to human. And when it's moving from human to human and adapting to its new host, it's picking up these mutations, making it more adaptable to that space, making it better to fit in the human, um, in the human environment. So as it's doing that, it can pick up changes that potentially could make it more infectious. And we've seen that with the Delta variant that is uh, now that has now become the most dominant strain around the world. Or it could pick up mutations that make it more pathogenic, that cause the disease to be more severe. Therefore, understanding which one of those mutations can cause such changes in the clinical outcome is absolutely critical. So here we went in and analyzed <clears throat> the genomic data of the virus from all around the world. We had in total 5,000 samples, 2,000 of people with severe disease and 2,000 people with mild outcomes of the disease or no symptoms at all. And we used variants bug in order to identify which one of those changes are actually clinically relevant. Now, this is important going forward to really understand what kind of mutations we need to look out for, say at border screenings or going forward with our vaccine developments. But here the message again is out of these sheer volumes of data that um, are out there, we were only to annotate 5,000 individuals with the, um, with, it, with the data set that we could actually use. Why is that? So in, when COVID started, um, right at the beginning, the largest database around the world that collects this kind of data had a field called patient status. And in there, it would collect information of how the patient was going that had this particular strain of the virus. Back then, hardly anyone would fill in that field and it was left blank. JSA then in October changed it to be a mandatory field so that people actually had to enter something. But it was free text. So people were entering unknown because they typically didn't know. And this has not really changed um, since then. So there's this massive amount of information that is brought, that is put in there, but it's not very usable because it is free text and people can put in whatever they want in there. And I would argue that having an API here, again, that brokers between this, these data silos that can translate between the free text and a clinical annotation, for example, is absolutely critical. And that's exactly what we've done. We partnered with GIS8 and we proposed a way of reading in this data in a more structured way. 
And this is using FIRE, which is a standard that is emerging in the medical field, a clinical terminology um, standard for capturing that kind of information. So it is capturing the specific information that is relevant to COVID, like for example, the vaccine status or the background or what kind of symptoms people had. And it is then able for people to type in their free text, but then on the fly translate that to a clinical terminology where each um, term has a parent term and it's sort of linked within this whole medical dictionary um, to, to make it more useful. So hopefully going forward, we can be using, you know, all this information that is out there, the by now 3 million samples that are collected from around the world. Hopefully we can salvage a little bit more than just 5,000 to understand how the genome is influencing the outcome of the disease. Broadening this, um, CSRO has developed the onto server in general, which is a fire-based terminology that enables the syndication of clinical terminologies. And it's supporting the advanced use of SNOMED CT, and as I said, underpins UK's and Australia's national health system. So with this kind of information becoming more prevalent to be used in the clinical practice, and specifically genomic underpinning all of this, it is not surprising that more and more genomic data sets are collected from around the world. And Frost and Sullivan predicted that by 2030, 50% of the world's population will have been sequenced. And this is expected to create more data in genomics than the traditional big data disciplines, YouTube, Twitter, and astronomy combined. So in order to handle this kind of workload efficiently, because you can't just wait longer in the medical space, right? You, you have the patient and the patient needs to be treated right now. So all you can do is throw more compute at it. And that's exactly what we are, in, what we are trying to enable using serverless or more cloud native solutions. The way I think about them is that we're all familiar with desktop compute, but the focus is to have full control over what you're doing, what kind of programs you're installing, um, and, and basically have the flexibility to do whatever you want with the system. Also, it's cost effective, but you only have that one system. And um, therefore, it's the analogy that I think about it is like having your own car. You only have that one car. And on top of that, you actually are responsible for that car. You need to bring it to service and look after it. If you want to be more flexible or more scalable, like have multiple cars or different kinds of cars and don't want to look after that car, you could hire a chauffeur. That person would bring the car to the service or could exchange it to a bigger car when you need it. And the equivalent of that would be to use auto scaling groups in the cloud. But like a chauffeur, auto scaling groups come with a price tag. It's not a cheap option because once you scale up to those massive resources, they don't simply go away when you don't need them anymore. It takes time to downscale them. Similarly, you can't just snap your finger and have um, a larger amount of, inf uh, of, of um, infrastructure there. And this is exactly the gap that serverless is filling, where the focus is on agility. So here, you still have the focus, you still have the flexibility, you don't have any overlap, you still have the scalability, but it doesn't come with a price tag. Because here, the systems come on and go away instantaneous. And I think about that like a ride-sharing app, where you can demand a car right here and now, and it goes away when you don't need it anymore. So with this kind of flexibility, we went into the genomic data sharing space and tried to reinvent sort of the, that paradigm. Here, we developed a mechanism where clinicians can go in and query this large amount of data that is available around the world and ask for a specific location, whether that specific location has seen a specific genotype, which is a specific letter there. And the system would come back with a yes, no, or a frequency. Now, this is important for rare disease research. 
where clinicians might have multiple potential mutations or misspelling in the genome that could cause the disease. Each one of those would have a different treatment outcome. And the clinician needs to confirm that for this particular patient, which one of those is actually the, the culprit, which one is the one that is causing the disease. And the clinician is doing that by looking at other data sets around the world, whether that mutation is present in the other data sets, because if it is, chances are this mutation is actually not that bad to cause such a severe genetic disease, and therefore it can be ruled out. And by that, the clinician can narrow down to the actual culprit and then come up with the treatment strategy that best works for the patient. So as I said, we're using serverless technology in order to do that, um, where we have multiple Lambda functions that work together, which is sort of the core of serverless uh, or functional compute. It's sucking in data from an S3 bucket and it's serving out the data to the individual uh, clinician through an API, namely the API gateway. So with that, we were able to reduce the cost of sharing genomic data uh, 300 fold. So rather than having to pay $4,000 a month, we brought that down to $15. So for less than a cup of coffee per day, researchers or consortia around the world can contribute their valuable information to the clinicians that need it most, to the patients to help narrow down what kind of diseases they have. So I hope that with this approach, there are more organizations around the world inspired to share their data uh, through this privacy preserving method that is cheap and easy to set up. And again, the core aim here or the core message here is that an API is, is empowering this, brokering the analytics to another analytics system. So it will be the API from um, the serverless beacon system to an API that is on the clinician side to match then that information with the patient outcome. Doing this, we have the ambitious goal of making this possible to handle population scale data sets. So this will be, say, for example, the population of the US, which is 350 million samples. Each of those have 3 billion letters that they need to contribute. So this would create a data source of one quintillion data points. And we are confident that our beacon protocol with the APIs that we have um, developed can handle this in real time. So this brings me to the second story around manipulating the genome. So manipulating the genome is typically done with genome engineering processes like CRISPR. And Jennifer Doudner, who received together with Emmanuel Charpentier the Nobel Prize last year for their work in CRISPR. And she was saying, the world around us is being revolutionized by CRISPR, whether we're ready for it or not. And I think this is a very telling quote, because in a very short period of time, CRISPR, this ability to edit the genome of a living cell has really taken over um, a lot of disciplines or has enabled a lot of disciplines from designing new model organisms in medical research to really understand the disease course and the interplay between the genome and the phenome, or the, the, the outcome, the clinical outcome, to doing large scale screens to identify the functional consequences of individual mutations in that, uh, in particular organisms to biosecurity approaches, where it's helping to keep invasive species at bay or prevent malaria from spreading, to then gene therapy, where genetic diseases might be cured one day or um, cancer could be treated in a more tailored, more efficient and less destructive way to the rest of the organism. So basically CRISPR, you can think of a mini postman whose uh, core aim is to go to a specific location in the genome, like to a specific address in that genome and deliver some sort of uh, um, 
mechanism there, either cutting the genome or inserting something in it or changing it, repairing it. But like a postman needing a specific unique address, CRISPR does that too. And this is one of the big tasks in that space to come up with that unique address that is only at a specific location rather than having similar addresses around the genome and therefore causing the machinery to go to accidentally other places and destroy genes rather than repair them. So there need to be new methodologies in order to uh, really make the have this process be safe and securely deliver to that particular location. And this is what we're doing, what we're working on together with the Children's Medical Research Institute here in Sydney. The task here is to cure a specific uh, genetic liver disease that affects children. And the task is to firstly bring this genetic machinery, you know, the, the editing machinery to the liver specifically and then within the liver cells to this particular location in order to correct the misspelling. Now this is like a rocket landing somewhere in the uh, galaxy because when you think about it our genome has you know three billion letters and stretched out it's about two meters long. There are one trillion uh, three tr trillion cells in our body and together that is actually a space that is larger than the, our current galaxy. And therefore for this little machinery to go to a specific location in a specific tissue is an absolutely massive task and compute intensive task. So with this, getting to a point where gene therapy is part of the clinical routine is still a long way ahead. Not only do we need to know which location or which tissue is affected, we also need to package it up to only go to that particular tissue, to then only go to a specific location in the uh, genome of those tissues. It also needs to be safe so that patients, you know, different patients with their different genomic profile um, can use the same drug. On average, there are 2 million differences between one person and the next. And each one of those differences can change how this CRISPR mechanism is interacting with your genome. And then of course, once all of this is worked out in theory, it needs to go into clinical practice or clinical care, um, trials in order to work out whether all that theory is actually working in practice. So we specifically focus on multiple areas of those uh, to make this approach safer, better, and more efficient. And we're doing this again by using APIs. Specifically, our system is designed so that um, it is again serverless, which makes it modular, so that each one of those Lambda functions can be exchanged with a new Lambda function that is either specific to the tissue or specific to new information that comes out. Therefore, we can easily exchange these modules through the APIs that we developed so that the whole system does not have to be reinvented every time there is a new information that is coming out. So with this concept, we developed a GT scan, which we think of as a search engine for the genome, where researchers can type in the gene that they want to edit and how they want to edit, and it comes up with the best strategy, the safest strategy, the most efficient strategy for it to do it. So GT scan was the first serverless application um, back in 2016. And it showed that basically this concept of cloud native of serverless can be used in complex workflows, such complex workflows that they can enable genomic research or even clinical practice. So as I was saying that the API really of GTScan is what underpins this flexibility, which means it can be accessed from the outside to answer even more complex questions than can you find the perfect editing spot. So for example, you can hit that API with the question of, can you find editing sites 
target sites for the editing machinery that are specific to heart but would not affect liver or the rest of the organism for that matter. And again, with GT Scan, you can develop a Jupyter notebook to hit the API with exactly that question and then do follow on um, analysis from there. We also extended that to the COVID space or the disease, infectious disease space at large, where you can um, ask to develop a, um, a diagnostic platform. So CRISPR can also be used rather than editing or changing something to just bind and um, this particular location that it binds. If that is unique to a particular organism, then that is a kind of diagnostic to differentiate between one strain of COVID, for example, and another. And with GT Scan, we can exactly do that. We can differentiate between the strains that are sort of the background that are harmless in quotes versus the ones that potentially are more pathogenic or more um, infectious. So this brings me to the last story around how to modernize collaborations. I would argue that cloud really has made talents and solutions much more accessible. Individuals, what we had before, are now working remote and probably even remote from overseas. Similarly, with, uh, uh, with individual solutions that can be brought in in order to boost the pipeline or the workflow or the architecture that um, a company already has. So with that concept or with that aspiration, we brought VariantSpark, which was our genomic analysis toolkit, to the AWS marketplace. It was the first digital health product from a public sector organization to do so in 2019. And it really enables not only the distribution of a commercial and you know, academic solution into a commercial world, but for us, it also enables the holy grail of reproducible research. So in the medical space, the findings that you have are only as good as if someone else is able to replicate it. So therefore, whatever disease gene you find, someone else needs to replicate it before it becomes uh, an accepted knowledge. And being able to replicate that is typically quite complex because typically the other person has to install the software, has to run it in a similar way, has to have the same workflow, the same architecture, the same libraries installed, which is typically a nightmare. Yes, Docker helps a little bit, but there's still variability. But with the marketplace, that variability is completely removed because you can spin it up on exactly the same hardware, on exactly the same conditions, in exactly the same way that the developer has intended it to. And therefore you can not only replicate, which means do running exactly the same analysis um, as it was on the original data set, but you can also um, reproduce it, which is uh, basically run it on a different data set. So a slightly different data set, seeing if it's still working, if, if the information that was identified in one data set still holds on, say, um, a verification data set. So therefore, bringing our academic research to the marketplace um, allows reproducible research. And it does that, just to reiterate that, by having everything packaged up in that one file. So this is the actual algorithm, the workflow of how to run it, potentially the data, the security um, setups, and everything is sort of in this one file that you can subscribe to, and it spins up that exact architecture uh, automatically in the same way, in a security-hardened way uh, through the cloud providers. And I would argue that this kind of marketplace is some sort of API because it enables one computer uh, to talk to another computer um, the, and the person sitting in front of the computer talking to another person sitting in front of that computer by having this uh, controlled environment that um, is exactly the same in one side and the other side. So with this, the three things to remember from my talk is that bringing genomic data into the clinical practice really requires um, APIs. It is built on APIs. 
the data needs to be brokered with APIs, um, as well as how to facilitate the, the analytics onto the data. So therefore, we developed Variant Spark, which is a this machine learning method for finding new disease genes. Similarly, we developed our serverless beacon protocol, which allows to share genomic data around the world using um, the API gateway or APIs in general. Going a step further from just understanding the genome to finding the actionable insights in there, we developed GT Scan, which allows to explore new treatment avenues through gene therapy. So it makes genomic editing safer and faster. But the most important message, I think, is that there's this new era of collaborations, where the collaboration between academia, industry, between individual um, research groups or academic groups or industry groups is absolutely grown. So there's this demand for having APIs that really seamlessly talk to each other because we need to build solutions that are larger than the sum of their parts. So therefore the experts, you, that build these APIs, I, I'm hoping that you can reach out to the researchers or the clinicians and help us come up with this, um, with this new way or powering this new way of wanting to share data, wanting to share an analytics platforms and wanting to share knowledge in a uh, in, in a data-driven, compute-centric uh, way. Because you are the experts, we are just the users, and it would be great if we can work together more. So with that, thank you for listening, and um, let's go to the questions. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, <clears throat> thinking along the way to your conclusion, how can we get involved? Because um, the audience is full of people with cloud computing uh, skills, with API skills. What sort of opportunities are there for people like us to get involved either directly in the industry or potentially through open source projects or any of those kinds of things? Exactly. So let me start by saying you already have. You already have uh, contributed and transformed the way we do research by developing these open data standards, by developing um, a a, uh, a culture of sharing of sharing information and developing all these fantastic infrastructures that we are using now. So we definitely are mindful that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. But there's always more you can do. <laughs> and I would um, I would encourage you to reach out to say, for example, Variant Spark, which is this open um, open uh, data tool, open software tool where you can look in the GitHub repository. There are individual tickets, and some of them are straightforward where it will be easy for you to jump in, uh, contribute that element to the to the task, and then have contributed to genomic research. Great. So Variant Spark is an open source project that we can all go in and contribute to in some way. All of our tools are open, open source. Okay. So we really believe in this concept of um, you know open open science 2.0 if you want, where yes. the core is open access, it's published, it's peer reviewed, but then on top of that, we're building um, a commercial layer, which which is basically consisting of serving out that free that open core to the world in a easy way so for example through the marketplace where you pay that little overhead in order to have the system spin up automatically um, and have updated it automatically have the security hardening around it but you know that what you're using the core of it is absolutely critical um, because or is absolutely correct um, and you know exactly what you're getting because it is open source and it is peer-reviewed excellent great and Another slightly geeky question, the Onto server, is that based on semantic web technologies at all? Do you know? Um, so it is built on uh, the FIRE, which is this medical um, med medical oh, yeah, terminology right. service. Yeah. Um, it is not one of our products, I have to say. So this is one of the other uh, flagship tools that are in the eHealth Research Center. 
So therefore, the best thing is to go to that link that is uh, that I showed in the part in, in the, on the slides before, and from there you can go to the eHealth Research Center webpage, and that's then exactly, and that's then um, the way to get involved with this con with this um, with this project because again, it's sort of this massive project that is underpinning um, our healthcare systems. So if you get involved there. <laughs> You're definitely helping okay, out okay. your future, future self get better uh, healthcare. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's a good self-interest uh, angle. And an, another, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, what, what sort of interest or demand have you seen in variant spark usage? Is it being used broadly? So it is interesting because it is built for researchers and researchers have not yet, quite yet, embraced the concept of cloud. So in that in that space, it is still seen as sort of cloud storage, and still seen as um, something that you give your data away rather than having a more uh, stringent security framework around it. Therefore, the adoption has not been quite as um, as rapid as we would have liked because cloud adoption has not been as rapid as it as we would have liked in saying that though like the big organizations around the world that are really the trailblazers of these concepts they are using um, using cloud and they are using variant spark so for example we're working together with uh, goldfinch which is, a, which is a company in the us uh, which is looking into um, kidney kidney disease right. and finding better biomarkers for kidney disease and they have massive data sets that they need to analyze. And again, they're using variant spark in order to identify which one of those mutations could be uh, could be used in order to develop these risk predictions. Right, great. So maybe we can help the medical researchers get used to the idea of cloud being a compute engine as well as just a big bucket. <laughs> exactly. And APIs, again, is sort of the, the underpinning of, of all of this. Excellent. Well, APIs connect everything together. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks a lot for your uh, fascinating talk, uh, Dennis, and uh, thanks for being part of API Days. Fantastic. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Okay, thank you.